Thanks, everybody, for actually uh, being physically here. It's always nice to see uh, bodies. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, um, uh, yeah, so I'm, uh, uh, to give you a tiny snippet of, uh, so I'm Chris Hammond. I'm with uh, Narrative Science. Um, I'm also on, uh, the, uh, in the engineering school at Northwestern. Um, and a tiny little piece of my soul is owned by uh, Medill, which is the journalism school at Northwestern. Um, uh, but right now I'm on leave and focusing on uh, what's going on at, uh, at Narrative Science. Um, we, uh, uh, we work on transforming data into stories. Um, and uh, we're going to see, uh, I'm going to show you a lot of stories. Um, and uh, the uh, stories is an odd word for it in that sometimes it's a story, sometimes you call it a, a broader narrative, sometimes you call it a report, sometimes you call it a tweet. Um, uh, but we take uh, raw numerical data and symbolic data and we turn them into stories. Um, and so I'm actually just going to go to the punchline right away. Um, so this is a numerical representation of a basketball game. Um, and uh, it's uh, a relatively recent one. Uh, but it is a, uh, uh, a Nebraska-Wisconsin game. Um, uh, for those of you who are huge sports fans, who is a huge sports fan here? Yeah, I didn't think that'd be a, a massive number. <laughs> just so you know, just so you know, I too, I too am an engineer. Um, uh, 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 um, uh, but we take that uh, and we turn it into this. And I mean literally that and turn it into this. Ryan Evans scored 22 points and grabbed six rebounds uh, to lift number 11 Wisconsin to a 64-40 win over Nebraska on Tuesday at Bob Denville Sports Center in Lincoln. Evans and Jordan uh, Taylor both had solid performances for Wisconsin, who's doing 12-2. Uh, uh, Evans made uh, 9 of 11 shots from the floor. Taylor had 15 points and contributed 7 assists. Scoring uh, that few points is rare for Nebraska, a team that came in averaging 66.8 points per game this season. The Badgers held the Corn Huskers to 31% shooting from the field, hauled in 25 defensive boards while only allowing 8 offensive rebounds and just 9, three, uh, and just nine uh, free throw attempts. Wisconsin hit 51% of its field goals. The Badgers were hot from long range, lifting tw 11 of, tw of 21 uh, threes for a 52% night from beyond the arc. Um, my favorite line on this is, winning the battle on the boards was crucial for Wisconsin as it grabbed 30 rebounds to 24 for the Cornhuskers. With the win, the Badgers extend their winning streak to six games. Um, we, uh, we're doing this for uh, the Big Ten Network. Um, uh, we do basketball. Uh, we do football. Uh, this is a, uh, a mid-game uh, uh, mid uh, story. For football, we do quarterlies and finals. Um, uh, our favorite thing is that for, um, uh, for football, We'll do, the, uh, 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 we'll do the quarterly, the, game, the quarter will end, we'll, we'll get the data, we'll, we'll write the story, we'll deliver the story, and the story will be back on, will be online before the Big Ten gets back from its commercial break, um, uh, which excites us tremendously, excites them tremendously, um, and I wanted to excite you tremendously. Question. How accurate? Yeah. Oh my God, it's, it's directly from the numbers. We've never made a mistake. <laughs> no, 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 no. It, it's 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 all based upon the numbers. That, I mean, we treat the numbers as ground in some sense as ground truth. Although we don't quite treat it as ground truth. <gasps> yes, we do, and we can talk about that later when we talk about finance. Um, uh, uh, but I've given you the punchline, and now we're going to back up a little bit um, because I want to give you some context as to where all this is coming from, um, and uh, step you through a couple things, and then we'll get back. Uh, we'll get back to this. Uh, so I'm out of the uh, I'm out of the uh, Yale AI group of the 80s. Was that uh, Roger? Oh, absolutely. Uh -oh. We're not going to talk about Roger all morning, all evening. Um, uh, went to uh, University of Chicago. Um, uh, started working on uh, plan generation. Uh, uh, moved over to Northwestern University uh, and uh, started something called the Info Lab. Uh, and then started working with the schools of both engineering and journalism on content generation. And now have shifted over to uh, actually commercializing this uh, effort uh, at Narrative Science. Um, just, and I'm, I'm really not going to talk about this, but I, I gotta, I'm going to race you through this just to give you a, a real context for what this is all about. So my starting point in terms of what I was doing uh, was artificial intelligence, um, and in particular a brand of artificial intelligence called case-based reasoning. Uh, and it was simply the idea that when you see a new problem, you remember an old problem, 
You remember an old solution and you reuse the solution. That is, that you do not, when you get up in the morning and figure out how to get dressed, make breakfast, and get to work, you do not do that reasoning from first principles. You just do it because you've been doing it all, all along, and it always works. Um, um, uh, uh, if it works, it, rather than, you have a choice. You have a choice in terms of, uh, of uh, and I don't want to talk about planning. Um, uh, you have a choice in terms of, uh, in terms of running plans. Either, either you can just run a plan that works, and it might be suboptimal, or you can sit in a room by yourself for the rest of your life and think it through. And that would be the, <laughs> and that would be the, that would be the choice. Uh, so we looked at, we, we, we really were starting from the point of view that reasoning is remembering. Right, something old, something new. New thing comes in, you remember the old, you use it. Now, it's super important to understand that I was a very serious scientist at the time. Um, uh, and in particular, uh, I was a true believer in terms of AI. Uh, uh, and I continue to be a true believer in terms of AI. Uh, I believe that, um, uh, that uh, it is only a matter of time before every single aspect of cognition um, will be modeled in the machine. Um, uh, that there is, it's un, there's no question about it, there's no arguing it, uh, and uh, it's simply going to happen. But while we were working on what we were working on, we had this moment where we re something occurred to us, is that we really loved the idea of reasoning as remembering, but then we thought maybe we could remember other people's stuff. And that is, rather than thinking about it as we're creating a system, we're creating a system that is um, uh, trying to run plans based upon a corpus of plans. Instead, we would start thinking about systems that would do something else. Um, uh, and we had a bit of a refocus. And that refocus was uh, uh, into uh, frictionless information systems. And frictionless information systems were based upon the idea that um, rather than using a text box uh, as the way to get to information, you want to use the context of what you're doing. And in particular, uh, our starting point for this was if I'm writing or reading something, I want to do an analysis of it, and then I want to use that analysis to drive search. So I find pertinent information that is important for me in the moment uh, that I'm doing work, and I want that search to proceed without having any effort on my part. Right? And I want it to be on point. Um, so the notion here was that our starting point was text. That is the text that we were reading, the text that we were writing. Um, our techniques were both statistical and heuristic, right? I, get, I, I do a, a histogram of the, of the unigrams, the bigrams, the trigrams. I figure out what's important there. I notice that some things are in bold and some things are more towards the, uh, the top of a document. That means they're more important. Um, so a bit of statistics and a bit of heuristics. But our substrate was search. That is, rather than thinking about um, memory in terms of well-structured uh, data, uh, well-structured representations. We were thinking about uh, we were thinking about our our process in terms of uh, using a noisy substrate, search itself. Um, our technology was based upon query formation. That as I see something new, um, I figure out what's going on with it. I use it to drive the formation of queries. And our product was search results. Um, and our core point was that context can drive search. And in fact, context is a tremendous driver of search. Um, and our job was the support of content production. It was the support of other things. But a good way to think about it is I'm creating something, I'm writing something, and I want to get information coming to me that's going to participate in what I'm writing. Now, it turns out that we can use almost anything as a starting point. So that the very act of touching a book will get you information from the online world about that book. That is, really, what is the book? What's going on with it? Are there similar books, the reviews, quotes, author information? Um, which is essentially saying, you touch a book, you get a website. And it's the same notion. I've got something here in my hand, and it's a driver for finding other things for me. Of course, there are other things in the world besides pieces of text. Um, and we'd realize that we could start with anything. Um, and that is anything that had a barcode. Uh, and once we scanned it, we could get information about it. And we might actually be uh, providing, uh, we might be able to get something um, that is sometimes more powerful than information. That is, the ability to take action on it. Um, uh, and so you would find not only all the things that you would want in terms of reviews and trailers and recommendations, but the ability to say, oh no, just I, I, this is good for me now, put it in my next Netflix queue. And the idea, of course, was to start treating 
uh, the world as a catalog. And of course, there's any metadata. Um, and so if you've got a video, and that video has metadata around it, describing it, if it has closed captioning associated with it, you can use it as a driver for search. And in this case, it's a, uh, an episode of Good Eats. So we get stuff about Alton Brown, because we know he's the host. Um, we get related videos, that is other videos that, that are uh, from either the show or people talking about the show. People blogging about Alton Brown in the show. Um, from the web, because we know the show, this particular episode was about corn dogs. Uh, we find information about corn dogs, including my favorite, the history of the corn dog. Uh, crucial to anybody. Um, uh, we know what the plan is. What? We know what the plan is uh, associated with this. Um, uh, and so we can get the tools associated with that plan, and then we can get a collection of recipes. Now, there's a thread that follows through all of these, and it's a really uh, simple idea, is that we were building systems that exerted edit editorial control over their processes. That is, if you look at what you want to do, if you're building something that's going to take arbitrary videos um, and then go find information associated with them, you actually have to know that this is a how-to video. This is a sitcom. This is a drama. This is news. You have to treat the information you gather from them in different ways, and you have to go find different things associated with them. And so what editorial control meant for us was what to look for, where to look for it, what to filter out, how to label it, and how to show it. Um, and this was super exciting for us in terms of a transition in understanding what we were doing. But of course, there's that moment where you ask yourself, if you're going to do that, why not go the last mile? Why not actually write the story? Why not actually turn it into something that's not a list of results, um, but is a synthetic document or a synthetic experience um, that, actually, uh, that actually pulls all this information into one place, um, uh, one place that can be ingested as a, as a whole? Um, so what do you need to do that? Well, you really need to, if you're going to write a story, you need to know what the story is going to be about. Um, and as you're, if your substrate is search, you want to know what uh, elements of that story you're going to go look for. Um, you, know, you need to know where to look for those elements. Uh, you, know, you need to know which of the set of things that you found you're going to use. Um, you've got to figure out how to label them um, uh, to a great extent in terms of topic and sentiment, um, and how to compose those elements into a single thing which is to say what you need is you need the structure, what's usually referred to as the narrative arc. That is that, you, you need that. And if you don't have that, then how can you pull it all together? How can you make it into a coherent whole? How can you have it make sense? Um, and so we started thinking about what would it mean to build a system that actually kind of knew what it was doing in terms of constructing something, uh, and then we'd go find things that would become the elements of that system. Um, so we built a thing called News at 7, um, and we'll see, uh, we'll see how our microphone does here and where this thing is going to show up. That actually worked pretty well. Director Ricky Gervais stars with Golden Globe winner Jennifer Garner and Golden Globe nominee Rob Lowe in the film Invention of Lying. This movie is a comedy set in a world where no one has ever lied until a writer seizes the opportunity for personal gain. It is a PG-13 rated comedy. I loved this movie. In its amiable, quiet, PG-13 way, The Invention of Lying is a remarkably radical comedy. I really couldn't disagree more. Lying brushes more big ideas than commonplace comedies, but it hasn't taken those ideas through enough drafts to work out their implications, or, harder still, make them killingly funny. I think you get the idea of what it is. Uh, the input to the system is the name of a movie. Um, uh, the system knows about uh, movie reviews. It knows how movie reviews should be structured. Um, it knows about a whole bunch of different sources it can go to. So it goes to IMDb, and it finds out everybody who was associated with that movie. Um, it goes to Metacritic and Rotten Tomatoes, and it finds out how, what people thought of the movie. And depending upon what they thought of that movie, um, it's, it picks the particular dynamic that it's going to put together. 
and then it puts that dynamic together. And so the notion here is that we have a structure um, and we've got things like, well, we want to intro the film, we want to say, if, we want to say in general if people liked it or disliked it. We want to say something about the story. So if we want to say something that's positive about the story, we're going to go look for a sentence that's positive about the invention of lying with words like story, plot, writing, message. Um, if we want to say something negative about the acting, well, again, we're going to look for a sentence for this, that, where the, the, the affect is, is negative, the sentiment is negative, invention of lying with Ricky Gervais, performance, acting. Is we're going to look for these, all these components, and because we know the structure to begin with, we can fit these components together, put in some interstitial material, shove it through a, uh, a text-to-speech system and an animation system, go and find the B-roll, and bam, we actually have the right dynamic. Um, uh, the, uh, the throttle on this, of course, is, uh, is text-to-speech. Uh, because uh, much as I love the, uh, uh, the world and everything that's been done in it, um, it still is the fact that uh, text-to-speech sounds like it's uh, been done by a computer. Um, and the, 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 it doesn't sound quite that bad, but it's, but it's pretty bad. Um, uh, even there was a wonderful uh, experiment that was done where uh, when Roger Ebert lost his voice uh, due, to, uh, due to cancer, um, uh, somebody took and cobbled together all of his, a lot of his um, shows and put together a, a synthesized version of him. And he said, you know, it sounds like me. It also sounds like a machine. Um, uh, uh, and getting affect in is almost impossible um, uh, right now. Um, but the idea here is that because we have the structure, and the structure tells us what to look for, we can go look for it. We can find it. Now, there's this funny thing. And that is, everything here was built on this substrate of uh, search. A substrate of text. Uh, and um, it still is the case that for any individual piece of text, actually deriving the unambiguous meaning of that piece of text is difficult. Um, uh, so we thought, well, why not we go, why don't we try a world in which there is no ambiguity, in which there's clarity, um, in which the things that we're looking at have distinct meanings which are absolutely and utterly unambiguous. Um, so we looked at data, and we thought, why not build narratives off a substrate of data and data analytic analytics rather than search itself? And that is, let the data drive uh, what we're doing. So we started with sports. Uh, and this is the example, this is my punchline example. Um, our first uh, foray into this was actually um, uh, was actually uh, uh, men's college baseball. Um, uh, we actually, when we began, we had a choice. We could either do um, um, sports um, or we could do finance. Um, uh, and, prime, and for the same basic reason, that is, for both of them, there was a tremendous amount of data online. Um, we could get to it easily. We kind of knew what the stories would be, and we could use that as a driver. Um, we were very lucky in that we had a, a journalism student who was working with us um, who uh, uh, was a stringer for the Chicago Tribune uh, doing high school uh, football stories. Um, and uh, he said, let's do sports. And so we gave it to him and uh, a, uh, another uh, journalism student who was also a developer. Um, and uh, they built the first uh, version of this thing. Um, uh, we very quickly went on to uh, look at um, uh, uh, football uh, and then basketball. Uh, we now do hockey as well. Um, we do a lot of work for uh, the Big Ten because they, they fell in love with us. Um, uh, and uh, the notion here is that um, we can do a game story, a preview, an in-game recap. Um, uh, uh, so quickly and so accurately uh, that they really don't need to put their resources behind that. They put their resources elsewhere. Um, we also had a moment where, and it's important for what we do as a company and what we mean as an organization, um, where uh, during the season, uh, because we were doing women's softball as well, because once we did uh, men's uh, baseball, we thought, let's do women's softball. It's not a lot different. Um, uh, we did women's softball as well, and during the season, we are the premier author, uh, the most prolific author of women's softball, college softball stories in the United States. Um, and it's primarily because we're almost the only author 
Um, uh, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. We do Little League now, too. We've written uh, on the order of, of, of 350,000 uh, Little League game stories. Um, and every once in a while, when somebody decides to get cranky with us about uh, we're taking jobs away from journalists, um, uh, I point out that I have never seen a damn journalist at a Little League game. Um, and uh, if they would like to cover Little League, they can cover Little League. Uh, but in the meantime, we'll cover Little League. Um, we quickly moved on to finance. Same sort of notion. Um, tremendous amount of data. Um, um, uh, most of the data that we use in the finance work we do now comes from our clients. Um, but you get data like um, uh, the, the, uh, the stock history for a company. Um, what all the uh, analysts uh, feel about this company, uh, who their competitors are, um, uh, estimates from the analysts as to what's going to be happening uh, in, a, uh, in their next earnings statement. And that allows us to write this, uh, earnings previews. Um, so since September 15th, 2011, Red Hat's uh, stock has written 13.9 uh, to close at uh, 46.98 on December 13th, 2011. Red Hat will, uh, will look to keep this momentum going when it reports third quarter earnings on Monday, December 19th, uh, 2011. Um, the notion here is, uh, again, uh, we, can, we have, can have reach um, that uh, a, a straightforward, a traditional media company can't have. And so uh, Forbes might be able to do a certain number of earnings previews around the larger companies, but we can do, instead of 60, or 100, or 300, we can do 9,000. Because the data is there, um, uh, the analysis is there, uh, the ability to generate uh, the text, and to have the text be different every single time we generate it is all there. Our next step, real estate. And here, we have a client who gives us uh, data on home sales in about 350 metro areas. Um, and uh, they, it was a, actually a lovely moment. And to the, uh, uh, to the uh, uh, fellow who was uh, asking about you, it was you, you about visualization. Oh. It was you. I'm sorry, you, you, were, in the, you were very close, though. <laughs> uh, uh, um, uh, this company, and they, have, they, have, they have beautiful data. They have beautiful data. It's wonderful. It's complete. And they put together for their customers absolutely stellar, gorgeous graphs. And we had a meeting with them. And I was actually kind of crushed. Because I looked at the graphs and I said, oh. I said, you don't need us. Clearly, your customers are amazingly data savvy. And they were able to look at these things and just draw a tremendous amount of insight from them. And the guy was like, you, you are just so wrong. Um, and so what we do for them is every month um, uh, we, write a, uh, we write a recap, uh, an overview of uh, what's going on in these metro areas from the point of view of, in particular, new home sales. Um, and there are numbers in a lot of what we do because a lot of our clients want numbers. But my favorite thing is newest home sale number, uh, newest, newest, newest new home sale numbers give hints, uh, give hints market decline is deepening. Yes. No, no, no. I, I, we're, we're getting to it. I'm giving you some examples. We're, we're like two slides, one slide away. Damn it. Ah! <laughs> I know that moment where you're hungry for it. But I've got to give you a little breath here. Um, how does it work? Uh, it's, uh, it's actually kind of uh, fun. So our starting point is always the data. Right? Raw data, either numeric or symbolic. Has to be unambiguous. All right? And that's, that's actually kind of huge. It has to be unambiguous. Uh, what we do with that data is we do various, uh, stati we run various stati statistical analyses on the data, and sometimes not even statistical analyses, but just simple math on the data and comparisons. Uh, so, for example, if you have a game, if you have data on a game, and, I, and I've got Northwestern, uh, Northwestern 10, Michigan 8. In the data itself, it never actually says Northwestern won the game. It's just not there. And so you have to do a simple little thing and say, which of these numbers is bigger? All right? 
Um, more interesting is streaks. More interesting is seasons. More interesting is uh, players' ups and downs. More interesting is slumps. More interesting is, is it, is it a blowout? But that's the next step. So we go from data to some, a little bit of statistical analysis to facts, right? And these are, um, these are expressed still at the data level, um, but are newly derived features. Uh, and we tend to call them derivations. Uh, newly derived features that we can, uh, we can do something on. And that something is testing. Um, so there's the notion in, uh, there's the notion in sports of uh, a blowout. Right? A blowout is one team just hammers the other. Um, there's a back and forth. The lead goes back and forth between the, uh, the two teams. There's an early victory. Very early on in the game, somebody, makes, uh, somebody, somebody scores well, and they hold on to that lead. Uh, there's a come from behind. All of these are characterizations of the patterns that you see as a game progresses. Along with that, though, there are things like heroic effort. And a heroic effort is when it's one guy who actually made the difference. Um, uh, there's team effort. There's pitcher's duel in baseball. There's lots of yards, no scoring, right? So you've driven, you keep driving that ball down, and you never get it over the goal line. Um, all of these are things that we call angles. Yes? How many things do you need to make scores interesting and unique from each other? Um, uh, for, I would say for, um, uh, for uh, most of our sports, uh, we have a few hundred. Um, but what's great uh, is that come from behind, come from behind scopes over a lot of things. Uh, uh, it's, really, it's really kind of sweet. Uh, and so once we do a vertical, um, in, a, in a broad sense, like sports, um, uh, we hold on to a lot of our angles and reuse them. Um, Could you make new angles or detect new angles? Like if none of it really fits, do you not have enough power to... That's an excellent question. So, next step, uh, uh, um, uh, yes and no. Um, uh, here's the thing. 18 months ago, this didn't exist at all in terms of defining angles and running them. Before we start uh, doing intensive data mining, machine learning, um, uh, and uh, uh, manipulating the data to find new things um, uh, automatically, uh, we want to do so uh, using humans. Um, and in fact, what, uh, one of the things I'm going to touch on in a moment is that uh, what we actually have is I think a unique partnership between uh, engineering and editorial in terms of the how we actually proceed in doing these things. Um, all right, so we have these angles, and these angles actually the term angle here comes out of um, comes out of um, journalism. It's what's the angle in the story? It's that it was a win, yeah, but what's the angle in the story? Was it a tremendous win? Was it a was it a victory after a slump? Was it um, uh, was it uh, was it putting them over the top in terms of their standings? All of those things. Yes. In the old AI world, these were referred to as ontological commitments. Yeah. The issue with the, the one of the things we learned about ontological commitments is that sometimes they could not they may not be as consistent as we would like them to be. We don't write stories in general. We write stories for particular clients. And so the ontological commitment that we make in terms of what consists of a, what, what a blowout is, is the ontological commitment that the writing staff at the uh, Big Ten Network makes. I absolutely agree. Say, OK, I want to capture the definition of this thing. Did you get the same definition from every one of them? No. No, and there are, there are minor differences. But that means that the system is not the system has a point of view. Um, um, and I would say there is no such thing as ground truth in terms of what constitutes a blowout. I mean, there's just not. Um, it's all subjective. The system has its own subjective point of view. And here's a certain, here's, there's a, a, a super important thing, uh, ontological commitment. Um, uh, uh, and it's, a, it's, a lovely, it's a lovely term. We never use it in the office. Um, uh, because if we did, the, all, my, all my editorial staff would simply walk away. Um, uh, uh, we also don't use the term taxonomy in the office. 
um, uh, uh, because they just, it's like, why are we even listening to you? And so when they write stories, they write stories from their point of view. And then they negotiate with, editor with the editorial on the client side as to, as to how that story should be reshaped. Um, the, uh, even in terms of what is important, uh, ends up being interesting here. Um, uh, and the Big Ten is actually a good example here. Uh, we, uh, uh, at the beginning of, I don't know how you, if you know how conferences work, uh, but at the beginning of the season, um, all, the, all the teams in the Big Ten will play outside of conference. Um, and so Michigan will play um, uh, Florida State. Now, every once in a while, Florida State will beat Michigan. And we were writing stories in an AP style. And AP style focuses on the winner. And we got a call from our, our editorial guy at the Big Ten, and he said, you know, my audience is the Big Ten people. They really care about the Big Ten team. And they really don't want to hear about, and he wasn't angry, he was just like explaining it to us. He said, they really don't want to hear what a great team Florida State has fielded. Um, could, you, could you mention something about the Big Ten? Um, and uh, so what we did is we tweaked these angles because one of the things that these angles has, or these angles have, is the notion of importance and interestingness. Importance is not quite objective, but a semi-objective notion of how important an angle is. Interestingness is what does it mean to the audience? Um, and each of the angles knows about the, its interestingness, its importance, and the interestingness and importance of other angles. And so by changing uh, the interestingness of those angles, the ones associated with the Big Ten percolate to the top. And even though, um, uh, even though it was a heroic victory at the end of the game, the fact that it's a back and forth is what's going to be mentioned in the headline. Um, is that the hook? I mean, is some of the angles the hook of the story? Yes. Um, uh, and, and, and hook would be another term for it. Absolutely. So we get all this. But then, remember I talked about the arc? That's this. That's the notion that um, we don't have a story yet. We got data, we got facts, we got all the angles, but we don't have a story yet. And the structure says, here's how I want you to write this. Get me a headline, get me the lead, get me a paragraph about the most important thing happening on, for the winning team. Get me a paragraph that's really about all what's going on in the pitching. Get me a paragraph about some interesting thing that didn't fall under this other, these other categories. Um, and that is used to drive um, uh, to drive taking those angles and integrating them into a larger structure. It is then and only then that we hit language. And that is we have a representation of what's happened and how we're going to say it. And then we proceed to saying it. Um, now, there was a word I think you used, and that was template. Um, the system is not templated. Um, that is, at the individual sentence level, it knows basically how to say those sentences. Uh, but there's a tremendous amount of variability in what it's doing, uh, both at the uh, phrasal level and even the sentence selection level. And so for any individual piece of content that it wants to say, it'll have maybe 20 different ways structurally to say it. And then within those 20 ways, it'll have a whole bunch of selections of adjectives, of even ways of, of describing players, describing companies, uh, that all participate in the final uh, language generation. All right. So when we hit a new vertical, because uh, we now have a, a very nice horizontal platform that's configured, um, we ask the question, what's the data? What can be derived from that data? What are, the, what are the facts? What are the angles? What's our take on this kind of story? And what are the angles in general? How is this kind of story going to be structured? And then what kind of language are we going to use? Now, we actually do a lot of, um, a lot of work in finance. Um, and we have, actually, we have uh, one client uh, for, uh, for preview stories, for um, earnings previews. So right before somebody makes their earnings, uh, releases their earnings to the, uh, uh, to the SEC, um, uh, people are speculating about how things are going. And so there's, there's an earnings story around that company. Um, we have one client um, who likes AP style. And they're a just the facts ma'am kind of client. Um, and so we write in that style. We have another client that has a shockingly irreverent style. Um, and we write in that style as well. Same facts, same data, same facts, same angles. Slightly different story structure, but the language is all different. Um, you would never look at the two stories and have it occur to you at all that 
the same person wrote it, let alone that the same device wrote it. All right. So as I said, this is a partnership between engineering and editorial. Um, uh, it always has been, it always will be. Um, when we talk to people about what we're doing, uh, we'll always have somebody on the engineering, engineering side who will be talking about data, how that data is coming in, how we're, how we're loading it, how we're modeling it, and we have somebody on the, on the editorial side who's asking questions about, well, what kind of story do you want? How do you want it to look? How do you want it to feel? How do you want it to sound? What's the tone? What do you want us to focus on? Um, and it's these two things together, um, uh, it's these two things together that actually make, I think, make the, the technology, make the company work. Um, of course, uh, this, is, this, 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 is, this is another aspect of uh, talking about ontologies. Um, uh, we, our starting point, when we first built this, it was a big wad of Python. It was about that big. Uh, and then, so we had baseball, it was a wad of Python. And then we built football, it was a wad of Python. Um, uh, and then we tore those apart and we built a platform um, which could be configured. The configuration, though, was done, um, and this actually is still Python. Uh, the, uh, the configuration was done uh, in YAML, um, which I, I, I got to tell you, I don't like <laughs> uh, to begin with, personally. But I, someone who comes into, a, uh, comes into an organization and they have unbelievably exquisite writing skills, and you explain to them that they're going to be editing uh, a configuration, the configuration for a system using a representation language that differentiates between four spaces and a tab, and so you have representational differences between two files which are invisible to the human eye, that, that's really bad, it's, and it's really mean. Uh, so the tools we gave them were uh, 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 VI, Emacs, Text Wrangler. Uh, and at some point, when we're offline, I'll, I'll tell you, there was, a, uh, there was a Text Wrangler moment I had with, a, with, with one of our editorial that was lovely. Um, that just doesn't work. Um, and so we decided to actually build uh, um, a tool set for them that actually reflected what they were doing. Um, so from the, from the first step, they have an outline. They're able to say, here's the, here are the, the core pieces that are going to go on in this story. And then within those core pieces, um, those will expand out into components that I can work on directly, either the sentence level, the, 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 the sentence level, the paragraph level, level the phrasal level. Um, and I can say things like, you know, I got 10 angles that might participate in this paragraph. Um, and they're kind of at odds with each other because you ain't going to have a blowout and a squeak uh, and a squeak ahead. And, you know, those two things aren't going to exist at the same time. And so we're going to be able to say, I want a paragraph about however you want to characterize how this win went. Um, and depending upon that, we're going to say different things. Uh, so the angles are the drivers there in terms of uh, making uh, the low-level decisions. The angles themselves um, are really just tests on facts that we know about. Um, and then the facts come out of derivations coming from the core data, um, uh, which are doing things like, uh, this is actually for a, a, a political thing that I'm going to show you at the very end. Um, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's, this, is, uh, this is overall traffic, and given, uh, the, given the traffic today, uh, well, actually given the traffic of day one, uh, which is actually yesterday, um, by the way, that also annoys the hell out of them. That, that, that zero is the starting point. Um, uh, 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 <laughs> uh, uh, um, but because of the way the system works, I, I wanted to start with uh, yesterday. Um, so uh, 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 day one, sorted states, which is to say uh, states with the most traffic. Uh, give me the top one. Sorted candidates, give me the last one. Um, uh, this is dead last. This is the, this is a, we're, we're tracking the Republican primaries. This is the candidate who uh, uh, is mentioned the least. Um, uh, uh, and then the models, that is the data itself, that is finally touching it down to the data level, where we say for each of these objects that we care about, here's how that object actually breaks out into um, the initial data that we give it, um, and then any derivations that are going to be associated with it. Yeah. And do you ever derive new facts? And if you do, do you use a reasoner? 
Um, we use data analytics, which I am going to make the argument is a reasoner. Uh, simply would say if A then B, if B then C, then I will drive if A then C. Um, if A then B and B then C. Oh, oh yeah. I mean, you mean, do we change? Doesn't, the, yeah, that change. Oh, absolutely. It's a reason, right? Absolutely. So do you have a reasoner in the engine that no. does that? Um, uh, we have an on-demand uh, reasoner that uses um, uh, uh, numer that, that does the, that's based upon uh, numerical analysis plus some symbolic analysis. So yes, we have, we have, I mean, it's, a, it's an AI system. Have a, Absolutely. Have the thing that actually derives the logic of the, the first order logic that I just use as an example. Uh, how do I how do I put this? Um, um, yes. Okay. Uh, <laughs> would I actually ever express that to anyone who I'm talking to? No. I, I know. Reasoner in. Absolutely. And, and you built that reasoner in Python or YAML? What, what in in Python, do? sure. It's only doing numerical. It's doing primarily numerical, some symbolic. Um, uh, and it's not, it, it's not a reasoner in, it's a, and it's an on-demand reasoner where it's only asking, is this true? And it will do a little bit of reasoning to figure out if it's true. But all the angles are, uh, the, the, at the angles, the angles all actually uh, bottom out in, uh, in, in, in Booleans. And we, we, go from, uh, we go from the numerical data to things that are true in the world uh, as a result of that numerical data. But really, uh, there's a, an important point here. For some things are true in a story, um, but I wouldn't ever argue that there, there's ground truth there, but only because I don't, even, I don't believe there's ground truth anywhere. And I believe that whenever you form any sort of uh, approach towards having a, one single consistent ontology, you're dooming yourself to failure. Um, and, and that 97% of the world is subjective and interpretive. Well, within the confines of that, we have, have, we have a kick-ass reasoning system. Um, all right. So the result is the, abil the ability to do this. Uh, the ability to create, um, to be able to create um, uh, stories from uh, data. Now, we were actually having a really good time doing this. Um, we have about, right now, we, we, we're uh, about 20 months old. We have about 30 clients. Um, uh, we have 34 people um, on staff, uh, which is amazing to me. Um, um, but most of our clients in our early days were media companies. So we would do sports stories. We would do finance stories. Uh, we would do um, uh, stories in real estate. Um, and although we always knew we were going there, uh, we realized that there was something else that could be done. Um, uh, and we could start looking at the world of uh, big data. And we actually had a pivotal moment with regard to this, um, uh, where we were in a meeting with um, a woman who is a VP of strategy for one of the media companies we work for. Um, and literally, a guy came in with one of these and gave it to her. And she was like, Jesus. And we were talking to her about finance stories. And she said, well, couldn't you guys do something with this? And she like, starts thumbing through it. And spreadsheet after spreadsheet after spreadsheet. We asked her where she put them. And she said, on this shelf. And she said, I don't need a shelf full of folders. I just need two paragraph summary of the stuff that's important to me. Um, and that brought us into a different world where we came to understand that people don't want this. They want this. They want this guy. This guy who can look at this, pull out the interesting, important, salient pieces of information, and explain it to somebody. Um, and it's not just the data analytics. It's the ability to explain. Um, and in fact, in fact we, uh, we're, we're actually in the midst of uh, looking, we're doing a, a, a real intensive search for uh, uh, somebody uh, um, in the realm of what we call the, the data scientist. Um, and if you look at all the descriptions of the data scientist, the data scientist has to have really two skills, two primary skills. One, unbelievable skills in terms of uh, doing data analytics. The other is terrific, 
unbelievable communication skills so they can understand why they're doing this unbelievably terrific work in data analytics. Um, so they can figure out what it is they want to say, what it is one of people want to hear, what should be communicated. Um, the, it's all AI. I, I, I mean, I, 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 um, I, I, gotta, I gotta tell you, if you, I, I, I'll show you a couple examples in a second. So, but in story form, um, uh, we, we, this is the kind of thing we were hearing from people. We collect everything on how each account is performing, but we only have the people to explain it to our 10 biggest customers. Um, you don't get the game from the stats, you get the game from the story they tell. And my favorite, if I could spend a half hour with each of our clients and their data, I could improve all of their business. Of course, uh, the client here is actually uh, franchisees, and there were 14,000 of them. So that ain't gonna happen. Um, but instead, we can do the following. Um, we're actually in a pilot right now uh, with a client that um, uh, uh, is a large uh, fast foody kind of organization. Uh, and uh, they, have, they do have, they have 14,000 uh, franchises uh, across the country. Uh, they did a really smart thing. Uh, and that is because everyone in the world knows that in order to improve a business, you have to meter and monitor everything. Everyone knows that. And so they metered and monitored everything. So they gathered point of sale information. This is just at the uh, cut into slices for the, uh, uh, the time of day, because if I showed you the items, you'd know what the customer or the client was. Um, uh, the, uh, they got point of sale information for every single thing they sell from 14,000 organizations, and they, got, they put it in a box. And they said, well, this is going to be great, because people are going to come and look in this box, and this will help them. Uh, and it turns out that even when they took that box and said, here's the spreadsheet for you, um, they got about 10% penetration in terms of people uptaking the data. Um, uh, because if you run a fast food, if you're, the, if you're the owner of a fast food organization, you actually probably started out not being the owner of a fast food organization, but some working for a fast food organization and then managing a fast food organization and saving some money and buying a franchise for a fast food organization. Um, and you're really not all that interested in doing uh, the data work that you need to in order to get to this. The launch of the bagels and cream cheese promotion began this month. While your initial sales at the beginning of the promotion were on track with both your ad co-op and the region, your sales this week dropped off from, uh, from last week's 142 units down to 128 units. Your morning guest count remained even across this period. Uh, taking better advantage of this promotion should help to increase guest count and overall revenue by bringing in new customers. The new item with the greatest growth opportunity this week was the coffee cake muffin. Uh, increasing your sales by just one unit per thousand transactions to match sales in the region. That is, we know that other stores can sell this thing. You're not doing a good enough job. Uh, would add another $156 to your monthly profit. That amounts to about uh, uh, $1,872 a year. It turns out that if you get that little piece of paper uh, with that on it, you actually read it and you listen to it. Um, because this tells you what to do. And this is based on how you're doing, the fact that it's new, how other people are doing, what the margin is on this item, and what, what's, the, what's the one item with the least number of sales you have to change and the highest margin that will have the greatest impact for you. Now, you can look at a spreadsheet and figure that out. You, there's absolutely no question about it. You won't do it. You won't do it. But you will read this. Absolutely. Education. Uh, um, imagine you had 50,000 students um, uh, who were learning how to uh, who are ramping up on taking entrance exams. Uh, and you had an online service for them. Uh, and you had all their scores. Now your online service is, uh, to a great extent, automated. They can take the tests online. The tests are scored automatically. Uh, and now you want to talk to them. So what we do is we take those numbers and we do the following. Um, you're in the 29th percentile in phase uh, four nationally, and the 88th percentile compared to your peers in any town USA, your local area. Uh, your score has been fluctuating a great deal over the course of the four phases. You need to work on your overall consistency. Specifically, you struggle with the more difficult questions in all three subject areas. 
You're also missing more of the moderate questions than your peers, which brings your scores down. Think carefully before answering your questions. Remember that you lose points for every incorrect response you give. Your scores are lower than they have to be because, you're an because you answer every question instead of skipping the ones you don't know. Nice, sweet piece of advice. Um, of course, every single question, we know what it's a question about. And in fact, we know what section of the material it comes from. There are some ways in which you can improve your scores in physics. You should focus your studies on the sections dealing with magnetics and electrostatics. These are the topics on, on which you score the lowest. Your weakest area in, in chemistry is uh, aldehydes and ketones. You consistently miss questions dealing with that topic. You also seem to have difficulty with the easier questions about nitrogen-containing uh, compounds. Math is your strongest subject, but you still uh, miss a lot of the difficult questions. The topic of definite integrals seems to, uh, seems to catch you out most often. So we can give specific one-on-one -on -one advice aimed at an individual based upon those numbers. Yes? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, it, there's, there's the platform. Uh, the problem, by the way, the platform is called Narwhal, uh, which is the whale, but with two R's. Um, uh, uh, <laughs> again, we're a partnership between engineering and editorial. Every once in a while, engineering names something. Uh, um, uh, uh, but this is all a single platform, uh, a single platform going through the same process, data, facts, angles, structure, language. All right. Where am I? Oh, I'm gonna I'm not I'm gonna skip this one because even though it's fascinating, uh, what? I got till five thirty. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh! I'm not gonna skip this one. <laughs> All right. Performance. Um, by the way, the system also uh, we 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 haven't we haven't been paying attention. The, we you know we we do what everybody else does. We meter and monitor everything because we got a lot of we got a lot of machines that we ramp up and ramp down. We have to look at the loads. We have to look at memory. We have to look at disk utilization. We have to look at all those things. Uh, of course, that generates a lot of data. <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, uh, we had a we had a project for a while. We're going to bring it back. Uh, the, the system would actually talk about itself. Uh, and we talk about the clients it was doing work for, and the difficulty it was having on this machine, and maybe this machine was being overutilized, and maybe this machine was being underutilized, and we weren't saving as much money. And uh, to a retreat. Uh, um, uh, well, actually, we want to have it. We want to have it blog. Just, <laughs> just, just sitting here blogging about itself. Oh man, it was a busy day. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, this is performance. Uh, online uh, marketing services. So I want, uh, I want to put my ads online. Uh, and so I go to an agency and I say, OK, here, here are the ads I want. Um, uh, here are the creatives I'm going to give you. Um, here are the demographics I care about. Um, uh, uh, give them to me. And here's the, here are the metrics. Here's the, here's the target. Give them to me. You take all that stuff, you put it into a system. And it's doing things like it's buying some words. Um, it's, uh, it's making s uh, decisions about what sites to put things on. And you're metering and monitoring. This is, by the way, the we can only talk to our top 10 customers. Um, a ton of what you do is automated or semi-automated, um, but you're generating a tremendous amount of data. And the question is, as you scale something like that, if it's semi-automated, you still have people in the loop, and that's fine. But you can scale it. But if you scale it in a way that means that you can no longer talk to your clients, you're kind of messing yourself up as a company, um, because you can't have those conversations and those clients go away. Um, uh, so what we did was we took a look at their data um, and we did uh, client-based performance reporting. Uh, so this week's performance is looking exceptionally good. In the past three weeks, we have seen a nearly 20% rise in click-through with the figure uh, moving from 0.11%, uh, uh, which is a good, a fine number, in the middle of the week of March 24th uh, to 0.13% uh, uh, this week. Um, uh, things, pulling out things like uh, the biggest channel, uh, channel driver is still the news and information channel that has an over, through, uh, overall click rate, uh, click through rate of 0.1% uh, up from 0.12% uh, uh, a month ago. Um, this is actually just a straightforward positive report. Um, uh, there's an interesting thing that happens, and that is what happens if you want to say something negative. So you have a client, and you've messed something up. And I'm not even talking about marketing services. You have a client and you mess something up. If you're going to tell them that you messed something up, what else do you want to tell them? 
Anybody? Yeah. How to fix it. Yeah. How to fix it. Um, uh, and so part of this, and it's not in this example, I'm sorry. Part of this is you're not hitting the demographic that you wanted to hit. We suggest the following changes. Um, uh, and so in the next iteration, we should do it the following way. Um, and the notion here is that you can actually have, uh, and I, I hate to use the word, but it's the, it's the real word. You can, have, you can actually have a personal relationship mediated by the machine with clients um, uh, that explain the good, expose the bad, uh, and then bring them on to the fixes. Um, and this is a really powerful uh, tool. By the way, we also, <laughs> uh, we also, we also do graph generation. Um, but any, anyone, anyone can do that. <laughs> Golly, graph generation. Um, OK. So we're kind of walking into everything uh, because I, it's amazing. Uh, there's just there's so much data. Um, and everybody's got it. Um, uh, in pharma, we're looking at the idea of uh, taking the data generated uh, through clinical trials and, and creating clinical reports. Um, uh, in politics, polling information. Sports, you can see it. Finance, you can see it. Real estate, you've seen it. Sales, you know, down to the level of looking at performance comparisons of your different sales, uh, your different salesmen, looking at how they're doing in the different markets, which markets are doing, be are doing better or worse, where you should put your emphasis. Um, all grounded in data. Um, the reality is, is that wherever there is data, we can tell a story. Yeah. One tiny proviso, wherever there is structured data. Um, and in fact, I actually, I, 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 I'm, there, there, are two, there are two terms that I, I tend to use uh, uh, where I have, I have bugaboos about. I tend not to call computers computers. I call them machines. It's like, bring it to the machine. Um, uh, my CEO explained to me that it just scared the hell out of everybody whenever I did that. Because um, uh, they understood computers, but when I say, well, and the machine is there, isn't it? Uh, it just, they, they find it very disturbing. I, 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 so I'm trying to break myself of that habit. Um, uh, the other is the word data. Um, uh, everybody, the, the, there's a, the, the term big data has been floating, has, been, has really been popping uh, a lot recently. Um, uh, and uh, there's a great, um, uh, uh, there's a, uh, uh, a great quote, I think, I, I think it was Balmer, um, who commented that um, uh, from the dawn of civilization to, uh, to today, or, or to, 19, to 2005, um, you know, the, the, the world created five terabytes of data, uh, and then we now do that every two days. And it's, but it's not data. Um, uh, and uh, I, for what we do, it's always important for us to think in terms of there's data, and which I mean machine-readable, unambiguous, structured. Uh, and there's information, human-readable, unstructured, floating about in the world. Um, and we need the structured. But you might say, what about the unstructured world? There's so much out there. Um, uh, and we do have an effort in, uh, we do have an effort in natural language processing where we're reading headlines. Uh, but uh, that's too hard. I just think it's hard. Um, uh, uh, it's not hard in the aggregate, though. Um, uh, what about this world, uh, the Twitter world, the social media world? Well, what we do is we track it and we tag it. Uh, and we do the simplest things that you can imagine. That is, we define categories of things that are associated with um, particular verticals. Uh, we look at the words and phrases that are associated with those verticals. We provide tools for quickly mining those words and phrases and uh, uh, building out these uh, uh, tagged, uh, uh, these tagged uh, collections. Um, uh, and so we can take a look at, for example, all the, the, the traffic around the Republican candidates. And we can see most, there's, most of the people who are tweeting about the Republican candidates are also tweeting about Obama. So there's a lot of uh, uh, talk about endorsements, uh, campaign and fundraising issue, issues, concessions, uh, the Tea Party, and so forth. So we structure it. And then we write stories, because that's what we do. It's our only skill. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, we've seen a bit of an uptake in uh, political talk today. Right now, the country is concerned about the Republicans and Obama. The topic takes the lead, but there's also considerable talk about endorsements and campaign and fundraising issues. There's also a lot of traffic about John Huntsman dropping out of the race. This is a few days ago. Uh, if the traffic is any indication, it looks like Huntsman is out of the running. And here are a couple of, of tweets that actually are indicative of that. Traffic around Ron Paul remained high over the last two days, and it has, in fact, dominated the conversation for the past week. The country is talking about him with a focus on Obama. There's also a fair amount of traffic related to people's take on Paul and endorsements. Um, and then we pull out the things that are being shared the most often, the videos that are being shared, or a couple of tweets. Um, and uh, we go through the usually the top two, uh, and then the dead last. Um, uh, uh, but there are cer certain features which, if they pop up, again, importance, um, percolate to the top. They don't quite make it to the lead because the lead is really all about um, the lead is all about traffic. Uh, but they do pop up uh, high enough to get to uh, what's called the nut graph, that first uh, graph where you're starting to, to you're starting to give some color to uh, a story. Is there a uh, headline? What? The headline is people are talking about Obama as Ron Paul continues to lead the online chatter, on online chatter. So, yeah. Um, uh, and what? Currently, who distributes this? Nobody. This is an alpha. What are your plans? Um, we're going to just put it online and let people see it. This is totally, this is, this is, I, I, and it, you know, not knowing the structure of our organization to give you how alpha this is, I did the editorial work for this, and I'm not allowed to do editorial work. <laughs> They're like, oh, Chris, oh. Um, uh, uh, this won't work for everything. Um, uh, but imagine, oh, products. Um, imagine, uh, uh, actually, uh, gadgets in the technological world, which is great because all the names are unambiguous and it's easy to identify them. Um, uh, 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 celebrities, movies, uh, events. Um, uh, and you have to understand that it, it, it's often wrong. Um, uh, and, and, and I don't mean in the aggregate. I mean in the specific. So it'll, mis, it'll misattribute uh, um, a tweet as being, um, actually, everybody does this, um, positive when it's negative. But in the aggregate, it'll catch the sentiment. Um, uh, in the aggregate, it'll see that the traffic is around uh, uh, concession. So we, we actually, uh, um, the concession, our concession tag uh, we put in uh, before uh, the, uh, the, Iowa, um, uh, the Iowa caucus, because uh, we figured we'd get somebody. Um, and, and we got Bachman, uh, and then we got, uh, then we got Huntsman. And one by one, we're going to pick them off. And it's great. <laughs> and, and, I, and I really, and what this thing is really doing is it's saying, I'm going to go through and I'm going to look at them all. Has anybody quit? Oh, Huntsman. I'll say something about Huntsman. Um, uh, so it's, uh, uh, how do I put this? So we're treating, we're treating Twitter as a source for creating a data repository, not an information repository, but a data repository uh, where the tags have specific meaning, um, uh, the, uh, the sentiment has specific meaning. Um, uh, we're just beginning to, to start putting cloud in here to get some more weight behind that. All of these things are noisy, though, uh, and it's only in the aggregate where you can begin to, to trim away a bit of that noise. Um, and for example, I would never say that John Huntsman dropped out of the race. Um, uh, because all I can say is that the traffic indicates it. Um, and that ends up being an important point editorially. Yes? How do you justify political nature? What we're just doing, we have a set of tracking terms around the candidates to begin with. Um, all right. So that's it. That's all I got. We transform uh, data into stories. Questions? Um, and I'm, I'm the guy who sent you the Bob Blum guy. Oh, yeah. The email uh, a couple of days ago. So my Stanford PhD thesis uh, 30 years ago dealt with automated discovery of enlarged clinical databases. So I'd recommend the area to you, Chris. It's yes. almost 20% of the economy. So here's a customer for you. C CDC in Atlanta, Georgia, wants to know who's getting sick, what are people dying from, you know, I'm, I don't know quite how they do their surveillance, but uh, I mean, there are 
death reports. There are just mountains of data. I mean, it's a huge area. I, I know you're stretched. It, oh, no, no. It's phenomenal. Uh, I mean, I mean th there was the whole big data push was about the mantra of meter and monitor everything, and there'll be gold. Um, and now we've hit a world where we can meter and monitor everything, and, the, and we know there's something, there's something in there, and it's like, what is it? Now the thing is, is that the, the um, and, and we, <clears throat> we do a little bit, a little bit of exploratory data analytics, but only a little bit. And right now, we're in a world in which there is the kind of analysis that we do really is a reflection of the, 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 the demands of the story. Um, and really demands of what uh, customer needs are on the media side, what business needs are on the business side. Um, uh, uh, the, the end game here is totally exploratory data analytics, um, uh, finding ways to name things. But then there's that the rest of what we do, uh, and that is figuring out the angles, figuring out the, uh, figuring out the language, figuring out the structure. Um, but we're doing, we're doing, I mean, we're doing some stuff in pharma. Well, it sounds like you got your hands. It's great. It's great. I, I've never enjoyed myself as much as I am now. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to do him first. Yes? Um, you mentioned the customer couldn't scale because they could only talk to 10 customers. They could only talk to 10 of their customers. You had a customer that they wanted, they had 10,000 customers and they could only talk to the top 10 or some small number. Is all the editorial work for using your system done by your people or can your customers do it? Good question. Um, that, um, um, uh, we, um, uh, right now it's still, I mean, we just, we just, we just, we just are, are in the midst of exiting the world of YAML. And I got to tell you, you go in and you talk to Forbes and you tell them, here's a platform for you. And by the way, you need someone on your editorial staff to write YAML. Uh, 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 they, they won't even, I mean, it's like, they, it's, it's a, it's a horrible conversation to have. And so what we're doing right now is the tool set that we have is for our internal use, but absolutely we want to have this out in the world. But it has to, there's a sort of a level of technical skill that we're cutting away, cutting away, and cutting away. So it all becomes editorial skill, yes. So what's your replacement for YAML? Oh, underneath it's YAML, it's just it's not exposed. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, 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 I mean, it's just not exposed. I mean, um, YAML in sheep's clothing. It's, it's more, and it's, it's less protecting them from YAML, it's more protecting them from text Um, uh, it's, 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 uh, it's protecting them from the syntax of it, um, uh, uh, as opposed to, uh, the, the semantics that's reflected in the structure of the, fo of the, of the, of the representation. Yes. Fear of saves. Um, you said something, there's a line in there about you give us the data, we'll give you the, the story. And often there's, there could be 50 stories yeah. in the same data set. Um, and sort of maybe connected to that, I was a journalist in a past life, and I sometimes take on the story, and then the story would emerge from the conversations. It was like the emergent properties of the data versus the kind of high. <laughs> uh, emergent properties, yes. Um, uh, this is actually a tension in our organization. Um, uh, 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 there are those of us uh, who um, there are those of us who want structure and say, "Here's the way the story's going to be." And there are those of us who are saying, "Why don't we have a looser structure and just have it be the things that are interesting will percolate up?" Um, uh, and so there's a little bit of tension, and we have a hybrid right now between those two. Um, uh, but think about the the online marketing performance reporting. I'm taking this data. I'm talking to a client. That's going to be one story. I'm taking this data. I'm talking to the team. A different story. Um, uh, the language is different. The tone is different. The structure is different. What to do next is different. Um, uh, the political stuff. Uh, we right now we sort of do an overview of the day uh, at the national level. We have all the state information. Everything's geotagged, so we can do a state by state. We can do a candidate by candidate. We can do a topic by topic and see the trending of the topic. And all of that's supported by the data, and it depends upon um, just doing it. Um, uh, we. Um, uh, in general, we'll, we, we strive to find uh, problems and data repositories that will actually provide us with enough to do not one story, but a lot of stories. Um, and uh, finance has been great for that, because there's, a, there's some core data that you use in a preview, you use it in the earnings uh, report, you can actually do it to do stock alerts, and we, we actually watch the market. And every 
three minutes, we look at 9,000 stocks, and we will tell you if something interesting is happening to one of them. Is a cool quick uh, joke add to that? Like, there's a class, finance is classic, they say the market dropped 200 points today because, ah, and so you'll say, that's, well, that's. That's why we're reading headlines. <laughs> uh, because we want to be able to say the market dropped today. And they don't say because. They never say because. Never. Right, right. That's, oh, that's, that's, they never say because. Right, right. Or, or, yeah, it's like they, they sort of put, put on the, the, what they believe to be the cause. I'm not saying it's a good thing, it's a bad thing, I think. But. You know, but, but, being, but, being, but being told stock went down, you know, American Airlines stock went down today on news of bankruptcy. Right. <laughs> wow. Uh, uh, um, uh, 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 Yahoo stock went down today because of whatever they did. Um, I mean, it, it's it's um, uh, the uh, but having the color around it actually, I think, it, uh, improves the story as long as you're careful about not uh, uh, attributing that color to. I mean, not 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 doing a causal attribution. Um, uh, but yeah, multiple story, multiple stories for single data repositories. Absolutely. Yeah. To your data. At least as an engineer, I'd like to read your story and then be able to click, push down um, through whatever process you had all the way to the data. Uh, and oddly, I, enough, I can, oddly enough, oddly enough, I got my own mind and that nobody can sue you. Um, well, um, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, I got to go to the data. Uh, we, we, uh, here's an, that's an interesting point. Um, right now, when we work with, when we, this is, this is a super interesting point. When we work with our, our clients, um, we'll send them samples I mean, because we go. It's an iterative process. We're writing the story. We're the system writing the story. How, what do you think? Oh, and they mark it up. We literally send them like a PDF or a Word file, and they'll mark it up and they'll give it back to us. And then you have to look at it and go, Why the hell did it say this? And you've got to track back into the data. Um, and so we're actually working on a tool for presenting information to presenting samples to clients, where they can still mark it up, but the act of marking it up percolates through the system so that we know every single moment in the system in terms of every decision it made, every piece of data it used, everything that participated in that decision so we can fix it. Um, and sometimes the fix is, no, actually, I, you know, the margin of victory is going to be bigger if you're going to call it a blowout. Um, uh, but uh, having that information is super important. For regular folk, it's not. I mean, it's not, you know. Uh, uh, the. Uh, I don't know what they want. Uh, <laughs> no, no, no. But 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 um, you know, for the kind of stuff we're doing, uh, we're doing now, um, having it uh, having it be uh, a dynamic document that bottoms out the data, it's not what it's not what, what people are looking for. And there might be a day, um, uh, but uh, it's not what they're looking for right now. What would they say? I would have been that would have been interested in getting access to that. I yeah. mean that whole. But you are an engineer. Uh, but you are. You may not want to sell. But you it. are an engineer. Uh, the finance guys may <laughs> well, want to I know see what? others. The finance guys might want to see, be able to see the data easily too. Um, uh, but not as a publishable story. I mean. Oh, no, no. Uh, yeah. that, I mean that's the thing. Is that that's that's what we're, we're building. I'm, I'm going to go over here. Yeah. Picking up on that earlier question, which I thought brought up something really interesting, there seems to be an assumption that you have a priori structure, uh, or fuzzy structure. And the idea that I thought was interesting here was the notion of emergent structure and discovery potential. In other words, you might have very strong structure at the end of the day, but you wouldn't have it a priori. Yeah. I mean, um, uh, understand there are a couple of things that, that uh, there are a couple of important points there. Um, one is that um, our, a lot of what we create is, is purposeful. It has a point. Um, uh, but a lot of what we also create is um, is create to fit into a convention. And so For Forbes does preview stories on their own, and they also and we do preview stories for them as well. They actually don't want us to have a preview story that reads entirely differently than their preview stories. And so they have a style guide for us. And most media organizations will have a style guide, will have an idea of structure, all of these things that um, they're not and they're not rigid by any means. Um, uh, but um, the, the, they give a shape to it. And even on the, uh, on the sports side, it's always the case in a baseball game. Uh, at the end of the story, you talk, about the, you talk about the pitcher of the winning team, and you talk about how he did. And you just do it, and everybody wants it. And if you don't do it, people will be angry at you. <laughs> um, uh, now, for other kinds of content that's more reporting-oriented, uh, that actually ends up being, there's an, emergent, there's an emergent document that comes out of it. 
Um, we're still at the stage where the emergent document comes out of the conversation with the client as to what it is that they want. And it's not purely emergent from the data level because we're still configuring the system. And we need to configure it so that it's getting the right, the right thing. Um, uh, the further and further down the line, the more and more of that work will be done by the system itself. But um, as, as you said, behind you, um, uh, we got a lot on our plate. Um, there's so much data out there, and it's so unintelligible. Um, and, and people are hungry. They're, it's, it's amazing. They're hungry for the story. Um, uh, and, and if they have a story already, and we can tell them, OK, we can give you 10,000. We can cover the world with it. Um, uh, that's exciting to them. Uh, because they can't, they'll, they'll, have, they'll have the 10 stories that they can sell to you know, a million people each in some sense. They get, they, you know, everyone's interested in, I mean, everyone's interested in the Apple earnings report. But there are other earnings reports that maybe 50 people are interested in. Um, and we can do those at scale. And they can, get, they can make those people happy. They can get those people the information they need in the form that they're used to, in the form that they want. Yes. Yeah, Paul Krugman famously writes about the uh, dismal science and makes it interesting. And partly it's from <laughs> point of view, and partly because he has all these uh, rhetorical techniques that he uses. But the remarkable thing is it's actually interesting, and it has a point of view, and it has a focus, and it's a pleasure to read. Can you match that? We can't match that. But you're asking me that. So you're, you're asking, can I, can, do I have a system that's 20 months old that can write as well as a Nobel Prize winner writing for the New York Times? No. 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 <laughs> <laughs> no. Can you aspire to it? Uh, um, You're remembering what you said about I'll, AI. I'll, 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 quite certainly, there, was, there were two things, there were two, there were two statements that I've made relatively recently. Actually, one in the New York Times, and, and one I was at uh, O'Reilly's. Uh, O'Reilly does this thing called News Foo. Uh, it's friends of O'Reilly, and they gathered journalists together. Uh, the first thing is um, that came out of a, a talk that was being given at Medill, and we had a guy who said, oh, you know, uh, I, you know, automated systems are coming into play. And he said, you know, 20 years from now, um, there's going to be a, a computer that will write a story that will win a Pulitzer. And I raised my little hand and I said, it's going to be five years. Five years. Um, and I'll be damned if it's not mine. Um, uh, and I'm absolutely on record on that. And it's, it's now, uh, uh, it's, <laughs> it's six months ago. Yeah, it's, it's uh, uh, but I know how we're going to do it. I know how we're going to do it. Um, that was the other, well, the, the, the other question at the news food camp, somebody, uh, oh, he's sitting right there. <laughs> somebody asked, 15 years from now, uh, what percentage of news is going to be written by machine? Uh, and I actually said, I really don't want to answer that question, because I was surrounded by journalists. <laughs> uh, and I was pushed and pushed and pushed, and I said, 90%, 90% of news will be written by, by machine. Uh, but understand what that 90% means. It's not that there's a pie right now that is all the news that's being written today, and we'll get 90% of that pie. That pie will be enormous, and that pie will be personalized. That will, pie will be on point to your local area, the things you care about. An intermix of, uh, an intermix of politics and, 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 econo and economic data that is all coming together for you so you can understand it. Um, uh, and the moment that we write a, you know, once a day we write a, a, a story for every single person, you know, in, you know, in the United States. Um, nobody asked about multilingual. Uh, every single person in the United States, um, uh, on that day, we, we got it. We won. I mean, in terms of that number. Um, and that number's, that number's coming. Um, uh, because we can do something at scale. And this is actually an important point. I mentioned, uh, uh, I mentioned Little League. It's a company called Game Changer. A great company. They have uh, an iPhone app that allows uh, family members to score youth sports, in particular Little League, Do -do 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 generating data like crazy. So we have a we have a relationship with them, and they once somebody says it's over, we get their data, um, uh, we write the story, we send it back. Our first version of this, by the way, was we wrote the story in the form of a college baseball uh, story, um, and uh, and Game Changer said. You guys are, are horribly cruel. Because <laughs> we talk about somebody failed, and they're not, it's like, no. And so our, our, our Little League stories are about success, are about effort, 
uh, are about, about winning, even if you didn't win. Um, uh, we wrote 350,000 of those last year. Game Changer was, Game Changer was going along, and then they had this boof, and now they're boof. Um, so uh, it will probably be the case that this year we'll write um, on the order of uh, close to a million stories um, uh, for Little League, and maybe more. Um, my goal with regard to this is um, we write a game story for every single Little League game that's played in this country. We write it in English. We write it in Spanish. And because I live in Chicago, we write it in Polish. We write it in a, way, in a, in a form that the kid can read, his dad can read, his family can read, his grandparent can read, no matter where they came from, um, and cover local. Any one story, 20 people, takes, you know, 20 milliseconds to write. <laughs> it's well worth the effort. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm going to say you, because you keep raising your hand, and you, you asked before. Yeah. Well, it's, it's all about scaling. You right oh. now have 30 people. How many stories a day are going out? Um, we write on the order of one story every 30 seconds. And when you bring on something new like this, I mean, how much human is involved? In it takes a little bit of time. I mean, it takes, it takes, I mean, to go from no data, and we don't know what the story is, to data ingested, everything in place, uh, all of the editorial work done, and we've got a publishing pipeline. It takes about two months. But that's something that we're squeezing down, squeezing down, squeezing down. Well, that's prep. Yeah. And then once that pipeline's in place, and the stories are incrementally set out, Oh, that's 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 automated. Yeah, it's totally automated. Okay. We hit. A, we always hit a moment where we hit auto auto gen mode, and we it's flipping a switch, and we never look. We don't look at it. We, I mean, we look at them because we care about the quality of our product. Um, uh, but um, uh, it's no longer editorial approval on our side. And then the question becomes, how does it get distributed, and who who buys? Is it the media company that buys it from you and then distributes it through their products? Oh yeah, I mean that Forbes example is. Forbes. Um, yeah, we we um, uh, the, we and we and are the media companies treat us like a writer. Um, we actually have one client, <laughs> and Forbes is the, one of the very few clients who gives us a byline, um, uh, 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 because some people are a little, so a little nervous about the fact that it's machine generated. Um, but there's no media But there's no media. Oh, no, no. In fact, Game Changer though publishes on their site. And so we feed them. So we actually give our, we give the, we, you know, we get data and then we, we hand content back to our clients. Um, uh, which the media infrastructure that's in existence today is incapable of reaching. That's exactly right. Those people. And there's a challenge there. Yeah. But, but all this means is that what we think of as journalists today are going to be, you know, working for guys like you to set this sort of system up. There'll be meta I mean, I, not all, not, not in no way, shape, or form will it be all journalists. Um, but I think that what will happen is you'll have, I mean, you'll have, you have a, you have a newsroom, and there'll be, there'll be your, 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 your traditional mold journalists. There'll be the guys who are, who are curating uh, social content, um, uh, and then there'll be the guys who are actually working with, uh, as a meta journalist, Working with configuring and doing uh, and doing data ingestion and 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 generation that way. I think we're just going to be another arrow in the quiver. Um, uh, and I mean, it's already social social and uh, and user generated content that's already coming in. Yeah, but and a couple of years ago, programmer was a complicated thing, and then somebody invented spreadsheets, and then somebody invented web the web, and then somebody got a wrapper so that ordinary people can make web pages. Right? Oh no, and and we'll and we'll have it be that that. Journalists can become meta journalists, and they can say, "This is how I want the story to be," and it'll have their tone and their language and their voice and their analysis. And that's like to be able to say, I, "Yesterday I wrote one story. Today I wrote the same story for 5,000 metro areas." And it's like, "Wow, that's incredible uh, to have that kind of reach." The Economist famously gives credit to none of their journalists. No journalist, no writer gets a byline. Is this a business opportunity for you? Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> probably not. <laughs> probably not. Uh, they are. Uh, uh, they are one of the. Uh, the. Um, uh, uh, I mean, they have a clear focus and mission, and 
Um, that's very different than very different than ours. Very different than ours. All right. I'm gonna uh, even though your hands not up, do you still have a question? All right. Um, uh, um, I'll take one more and then I gotta go and I gotta stop because I'm now actually beyond my time. Or, okay. Okay. Better the camera off. When the camera goes off, you can tell us the real truth. All right. <laughs> it's interesting to think about the time when you so dominated the industry that most of the materials you read in your research for a story you also wrote. Um, um, we have a we have a system um, uh, that is a parallel system that is also in alpha that reads headlines um, in the financial realm. And we read our own headlines. Um, uh, uh, and feedback. Um, uh, but that's, uh, but yeah, uh, actually, oddly enough, uh, because of uh, some things, our headlines um, are, because of very, we, we try to add as much variability as possible, our headlines are ever so slightly harder to read than a lot of others. Um, 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 they're not metaphorical, which is, are impossible to, to deal with, uh, but they're, um, uh, they've, they've got some interesting structural elements. Okay. That's it then. Thank you.